Do you think doctors today in India and across the world, of course, are trained to treat you once you're inside the hospital? They are not really trained to keep you outside the hospital. That is correct. And do you think that is where fundamentally we're going wrong in our healthcare ecosystem? Yes, and uh, there's data to back it up. If you see the countries uh, which have a prominent preventive healthcare system and where incentives are aligned towards keeping people healthy, they do much better. So you see all the Nordic countries, you see countries like Japan where preventive healthcare is focused on more. The government has passed laws such as the Metabol law, which prohibits people to have a waist above 33 inches. Hmm. And if the waist goes above that, the employer has to make sure they pay for you know, getting that waist Once down. again, tell me about this again. There is a law to keep your waist in check? Yes. It's called the Metabol law. It was passed in Japan, I think, in 2008. Hmm. And uh, it says that if your waist is about 33 inches, your employer has to spend to make sure that uh, the waist goes down. <laughs> How? Apart from that, also, they have uh, annual health checkups, which are preventive care checkups. Yeah. So a lot of things. And... Um, it's also become part of the culture and built culture. So doctors are also not incentivized to write prescriptions. Hmm. Um, in the case of US, for example, uh, you get paid based on your CPT codes, which are linked to um, the extent of the treatment or the medicine you're prescribing. Hmm. So the more expensive the treatment, the more money a doctor gets. Hmm. Uh, these are CPT codes and can be verified easily by anybody. Hmm. So for example, if... Uh, you, as a patient, you come to a doctor, doctor writes you an expensive treatment. Um, depending on how expensive the treatment is, how extensive the treatment is, the doctor gets a, a commission for that. Hmm. The same applies to medicine. Hmm. And to some extent, India also follows the similar system. I was just going to come to India. Uh, Japan actually has a very nice ecosystem even for kids in nutrition. They start teaching them what to eat right, and they eat a lot of local seasonal stuff, even in schools. And that starts very early. And I think that's the foundation for any good sort of, you know, uh, we healthy nutrition or sort of nutritionist well-being, if one can call it that, right? But compare that to India. Well, in what India, are we getting wrong fundamentally? Yeah, um, pretty much everything. I mean, there's no concept of nutrition as such. Um, mm. Because also... Uh, for a very long period of time, India was a country which had very high infant mortality rates, right? So the government's first priority was getting people enough food, hmm. uh, never about nutritious food. And so even if you look at the current policies of the government, like the mid meal programs, there's no talk about protein, there's no talk about micronutrients, it's just food. Hmm. Like any nutrition expert would look at the food and they'd be like, okay, this is like hmm. this is not a food that's going to help Indians grow their height or help children become better sportsmen, better athletes. That's not the food you should be giving to your kids. I mean, these are government-sponsored programs, right? So you'd see mm. some thought would have gone behind creating these midday meals. Mm. Doesn't seem like it. There are eggs in all that, though. A lot really? of controversial, <laughs> controversially put, I've, but I've there are eggs. I've not come across midday meal programs where the government is talking about giving them eggs. If anything, I've come across more criticism about how we should not be consuming eggs. Hmm. Um, I mean, at least in the current government, I feel the government is anti-eggs and uh, everything. So I, I don't think they are giving eggs in the middle meal programs. So what do we need to, we spoke about a lot of stuff that is going wrong. Yeah. Tell me, how can we sort out our nutritional needs and start by maybe giving me from childhood to adulthood? Because that's the foundation, right? Well, there's already an established playbook, which a mm. lot of countries have applied. Mm. And uh, the best example would be China. Um, because you see, China also had poor uh, genetics like the rest of the South Asian countries. Mm. But if you see in the last 100 years, China has increased their average height by almost eight, uh, eight centimeters, mm. where India has actually reduced it by uh, one centimeter. And if you look at the protein intake for average um, uh, Chinese citizen, it comes to be around 72 to 75 grams and sometimes even 80. Hmm. Well, in India, it's still hovering around 50, 60%. And again, we can also talk about how these numbers are derived because and the way these numbers are derived, because I went through the research, 
the way they derive these numbers in India, the government is saying, hey, we are, like Indians are consuming 60 grams of protein. The way they derive these numbers is basically they uh, look at the amount of ration a family of four has uh, bought, and then basis that they estimate, okay, so if somebody has bought, let's say, one kg rice for this, this, this month, and this is how much protein they might have gotten from this. Ah. Yeah, hmm. so it's a very poor way of estimating protein um, consumption in India. Yeah, but there is so much talk about protein. You are saying protein is directly protein linked is to there, yes. height. You are saying protein is directly linked into development overall and also nutritional values. But we are in this time where protein is both hype and protein is also a curse. We are flooded with protein brands in the country which are A, adulterated. B, doesn't really cut it. Our guts can't take it. It's not designed for an Indian gut biome or maybe say North Indian, South Indian separately because you're complicated that way. Uh, I think people are confused. They find understanding protein very, very tedious. Is there a good way to understand protein without becoming a gym bro and yeah. drinking jo a protein powder all day long? Again, I've been very vocal about how protein uh, was completely misunderstood and largely because it was it was used by gym bros. So everybody thinks protein is like a some sort of like a gym bro thing. In reality, protein is just essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. Essential amino acids your body can't make. So mm. you need them. Your entire body is actually made up of protein. And if your body doesn't get protein, it can't build the structures or tissues. Even a small baby uh, right out of uh, your mother's womb, when they drink breast milk, what does it have? It has it has whey and it has casein. Hmm. Without the protein, the baby can't grow. And over a period of time, what happens when, when the kid is taking your mother's milk, uh, the kid is getting the right kind of nutrition. But the minute the kid is off mother's milk, we start feeding them crap, which has hmm. like low protein, um, you know, then you have high in fats, high in carbs and processed foods. Hmm. And so if I have to, see, we have to understand that 90% of the development for a kid happens in the first five years. Hmm. And by the age of 10, hmm. almost all the development has happened, like brain development, hmm. right? So, and during this time, there's exponential growth that happens in your, uh, in, in your brain. Like your body has to produce lots of lots of neurons. Hmm. And all of your organs are also fully developed by that time, hmm. you know, by the age 10. And so what is the difference between, let's say, a Chinese kid or an hmm. Indian kid hmm. at the age of 10? We are not talking about stress. We are not talking about extensive exercise. Hmm. So what is it that's making the difference? Hmm. I mean, the weather is largely the same. So what's making the difference? It's the food. And in food, hmm. what is it that one thing that, that makes somebody grow or not grow? But like I said, protein is very complicated to understand it, to measure it in an Indian diet. Uh, I mean, a lot of us who now are protein aware have to keep clicking pictures and send it to chat GPT to calculate the amount of protein there. That It's it just, like I said, it's not easy. Do you have a playbook that people can follow to have a protein-rich diet? or a protein-sufficient diet? Yeah, it's very simple. You stick to whole grains, um, cereals, you look at lean sources of uh, meat, you can look at chicken, you can look at eggs, uh, uh, you know, any kind of seafood, all of this is good. Hmm. The idea is that you don't have to consume a lot of protein. And for this, you don't even have to take a lot of supplements. The idea is that of your total calories, protein has to be 15 to 20%. Hmm. Right now, that's not happening. It's but how do 10%. I calculate that on my plate? No, the and, government and, and, will and have I'm to. not somebody who has a battery of people telling them what to do. Yeah. We are largely, we are working people who have houses and kids and office and, you know, bosses and a lot of other things to manage. In my very busy schedule, how do I manage my protein intake? Look, grains are good for you. Hmm. Um, soy products are good for you. Then you have meat products, uh, poultry, uh, egg uh, seafoods, these are all high protein foods. So when you consume food more from these groups, you automatically get more protein. But how do I know what's sufficient, what's not? 
like calculating per weight per oh, okay. your kg so that way you know uh, the government has published a guideline so hmm. nin guidelines the icmr guidelines and those guidelines are available for public in different languages hmm. so it's uh, it's a huge like 200 300 page document hmm. uh, but there's also like miniature versions of them that exist i would urge everybody to go through the guidelines so it has like a clear pyramid which says first you have to have more fruits and vegetables then you have to have grains and uh whole foods then you have to have uh, lean meat and eggs and poultry and these sources and then on top it says a little bit amount of saturated fat and stuff hmm yeah okay uh if somebody is taking protein supplements mm-hmm. since there is so much of fat out there yeah. is there a filter that one can apply to know what is good what is bad what is just no go i'd say ask everybody for a lab report for every batch I think uh, there are very few brands in the con- country that are actually publishing batch wise lab reports. Hmm. If there are brands which are publishing those reports you can you can trust those brands. Hmm. And if the brands are not publishing um uh, you know lab reports batch wise that means that these guys are cutting corners. Right. And what about this additional protein high protein ata high protein eggs uh high protein bars high protein curd milk which has more protein additional yeah. protein yeah. how do we make sense of all of this right so there are processes for example high protein atta is actually a pretty good idea you know mm. like uh, because it's a uh, it's staple so one of the things that people have realized historically is that taking protein supplements um protein supplements are highly highly processed and so it does not work well with people's gut also right so people are moving towards high protein foods Uh, which are way more palatable because they taste okay and then because they also come with other things like fiber and everything else they are far more easier on people's stomach hmm. uh, right so high protein atta for instance they make it using either a, a soy flour a mix of wheat flour and groundnut flour and uh, right now we have techniques which can defatten these flours which means that removes the fat layer Hmm. and so you have the protein and carbohydrate layer hmm. and so this defatting process is how you can make anything high protein so for example defatted milk typically has higher protein defatted yogurt typically has higher protein so defatting is a is a pretty standard process which has existed for a couple of decades now hmm. and so now it's coming to india so that's a good thing what do i tell my mother and my uncles who say ki ye protein fat tumhari generation ka hai this is not how we grew up hum to dal chawal roti sabzi kha ke paida hue and we never had an issue of course they had issues they had issues they were walking they can't even walk properly hospital live on so many concurrent medications of course they having issues they just are living in denial how many of 60 year olds from their generation are actually uh, fit and healthy Hmm. not i mean if they were really fit and healthy why was india's life span is like 67 68 hmm. so living in denial just because they are feeling fine like 6 months out of the year uh, that's not something i would say supports their um stance that they're healthy and doing everything right they're not i mean i'm i'm way more fitter than my parents ever were hmm. at my age i'm 40 i'm pretty sure you're um in your late 30s i'm guessing yeah and i'm i'm sure that people don't believe you that right so when when you tell them i'm in late 30s people won't believe you because you look way more fitter and stronger and you go to the gym so if you look at us people like us we are already way more fitter and stronger than our parents ever were even in their 20s and 30s we are more fitter now hmm so i think they're just saying that to please themselves but it's absolutely not true but how do you define fitness like india has this phenomena called uh thin fat right yeah. a lot of our parents generation specifically they have something called visceral fat which is really detrimental which is what why it brings down age and other complications etc they don't really look fat but in india the problem is that people who look fit aren't really fit these are young people who go to the gym but are getting heart attacks in their 30s and their 40s and people who don't really look aesthetically pleasing could actually have better markers so i have a confused vision of what is fitness yeah no look again um you know fitness and health they go hand in hand and one does not necessarily isolate 
uh, from the other. Now, the problem could be that people can look fit, but then they are not really fit. That can happen. Hmm. But largely when people are fit, they are also healthy. Now, for example, a person like me, I have hepatitis B along with my brother since we were kids. Hmm. Right. So even though uh, we are fitter and my blood markers and every other marker is perfectly fine, but compared to a normal person who does not have hepatitis B, I'm at a much higher risk of liver cirrhosis when I get older. Right. So that could be the case. So people do have genetic issues without their um, any any kind of lifestyle problems. They could have genetic issues. Right. So that means that does not mean that those people are not um, fit or, you know, it's not worthy enough for them to try. Because imagine for someone like me, if I was drinking and smoking, I'd be in much worse health compared to somebody who was drinking and smoking without hepatitis B. Yeah. Right, so there's that. The another thing is, again, <laughs> uh, sometimes even media plays a big role in highlighting cases um, like somebody dies in the gym. But you know how many of those deaths happen in the gym? Like you can count them on hands. Like the celebrity deaths or people dying in the gym. Those are handful of deaths. How many people actually die of heart attacks in India every single year? 30 lakh people. But nobody's talking about those deaths. We don't show people sitting in their toilet seats and dying of heart attacks. But that's almost 50 to 60% of the people who die of heart attacks and die in their homes doing nothing. And we see... Uh, we we show a couple of like a dozens of deaths which are happening. It's very small compared to the number of people dying at home. <laughs>